chapter 7, the uh, beginning of the third of the three chapters in which we find the Sermon on the Mount, which we have been, uh, I guess, quickly galloping through over the summer. Listen to Matthew 7, 1 to 5. See what God may have to say to you through these words. Jesus is speaking. Do not judge, so that you may not be judged. For with the judgment you make, you will be judged. And the measure you give will be the measure you get. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your neighbor, let me take that speck out of your eye while the law is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O God, our rock, our redeemer, and our friend. I have worn glasses as long as I can remember. They are, at this point, an important part of my identity. And I can't see very well without them. I feel, maybe some of you feel this way, I feel naked, I feel insecure, I feel not in control of my environment. And before, I need to put these on so I can see you again. <laughs> before lens technology improved, my glasses tended towards the uh, Coke bottle variety. I've mentioned several times that my sight has taken a gradual turn for the worse over this past year. It's going to need some profession, professional intervention beyond corrective lenses beginning next month and following through the fall. Now I have hopes that by the time I enter 2023, I will, if not be a new man, at least I will have new vision. Who knows, maybe the next time I see you, I won't have to wear glasses anymore. I don't know. I'm grateful for both corrective lenses and for medical technologies that afford us the ability to remain at least somewhat sighted at levels far beyond what Mother Nature enabled others before us to do. In this morning's well-known passage from the Sermon on the Mount, our Lord is also addressing issues of sight, isn't he? But not literally, figuratively. He says that how we see or evaluate or perceive the others, the world, others, is always going to be distorted, affected in some way. That none of us has that coveted 2020 vision that allows us to 100% accurately evaluate and judge others. We're all visually challenged when it comes to how we see the world and how that leads us to make judgments about it. None of us can rise above the limitations of our common humanity. Now, I deliberately chose that passage from John 8. The woman caught in adultery, you could also call it the woman Jesus prevented from being stoned to death, as a perfect reflection or commentary on Jesus' warnings to, as the old King James put it, judge not, lest ye also be judged. And they did judge, but they got judged in return, didn't they? That's exactly what they show up to do that day with stones in their hands. 
to judge both this woman, supposedly caught, I love this phrase, in flagrant, for, can't even pronounce it, flagrante delecto, and where's her partner in crime, by the way? <laughs> right? As well as putting Jesus himself on the spot, judging him. So they throw her at his feet. What do we do with this woman, Jesus? The law is clear. At first glance, they have him over a barrel. How is he going to weasel out of this one? They're like sharks smelling blood in the water. And I wish we had more time to explore all the important dimensions of this fascinating story, including Jesus bending down to write something in the dust, not just once, but twice. I guarantee you he was not initiating a game of tic-tac-toe. <laughs> but this story mirrors Christ's caution in the Sermon on the Mount, and his response to his challengers could not have been anticipated by anybody. It's one of his most show-stopping zingers, and maybe history's greatest non-answer answer, because he does not answer their question. Let anyone among you who is without sin be the first one to throw the stone. Let anyone among you without a log in your eye be the first to take the splinter out of her eyes. So one by one, they drop those stones on the ground and slink away into the shadows. They are at least honest enough to admit on those terms that Jesus presents that they have no right to judge and cast a stone at her. It's hard to imagine Jesus could have come up with anything else so utterly devastating to their hubris and arrogance. It is brilliant. If you ask me, Jesus would have made a great attorney. <laughs> and Jesus literally saved her life. And he also sends her into the future with the possibility of a, a new start. Neither do I condemn you, he says. Go and sin no more. John 8. Matthew 7, feed off of each other. Those who are without sight sin, let them cast that first stone. Judge not, lest you also be judged. Those who have perfect vision, let them be the first to help others see better. Seems to me Jesus makes these comments about judging because he knows us. He knows our vision is always going to be, at least to some extent, distorted. That none of us has that unbiased eye. And he uses one of his most comical images to drive home his point. Like in that other story where he, he gets us to picture the image of a camel trying to squeeze through the eye of a needle. Right here it's a splinter and a log. What is only a, a speck in the eye from, from outside, from the inside, is so much more. So he asks, why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? Yes, why do we? None of us has a God's eye view of the world of others, even of ourselves. It's so much easier to be trying to attend to others rather than taking care of our own issues. And Jesus seems to assume that we will naturally, on our own, deny that we have that little speck or pretend it's not there, or pretend that we can look around it when we see others. And he is not, he's not addressing the type of people who threw that woman at his feet, right? 
He's addressing us. He is warning us about ourselves. That being disciples of Jesus doesn't automatically cure that natural tendency we all have to project ourselves and our perspectives out into the world, including how we see other people. And admitting that we all have a certain amount of limited or filtered vision is at least the first step to overcoming our natural tendency to set ourselves above, above others and, and go about trying to, let me just take that speck out of your eye. Two other things that are important I notice. First, Jesus points to the boomerang effect about making judgments. Right? Judge not, lest the judgment you deliver is that by which you will be judged. And we put it in different ways. We say, what you give is what you get. What goes around comes around. If you dish it out, you better be ready to receive it. And some say karma is a certain word that starts with a B. I'm not going to mention here in the Lord's hands. St. Paul puts it more delicately. We reap what we sow. So if we want others to go light on us, then we will give them some benefit of the doubt. It's a fellow preacher who applies this idea to preaching. He says, and I didn't really, really want to hear this this past week, don't become a preacher for the purpose of not being preached to. For with the same sermons you preach, you will be preached to. And the same conduct you prescribe for others shall be prescribed for you. Ouch! It's a little reminder that we should always be preaching to ourselves first. They try to teach us that in seminary. But all of us are called to practice what we preach with grace. Now, at the end, Jesus seems to leave the door open for the possibility that we can go after someone's speck, as long as we attend to our own log first. Seems to me he's setting a pretty high bar here. Because working on the eye, and Jesus is really talking about the human heart here, by the way, is a delicate operation. So it's possible in the process of attending to my own stuff, taking account of my own biases, those things that may have bothered me and you may just magically disappear. Because that splinter I saw in your eye was really only just a reflection of the beam in my own eye. And I think Jesus knows Thanks be to God for corrective lenses that allow me to drive, because I would be a hazard without them, and for medical procedures that help overcome our natural vision limitations. And God bless those fortunate souls, and I'm sure there are some of you out there who even in older age still seem to have that good sight the rest of us so covet. Actually, we really hate you, but no, no. <laughs> I see there are some of you who are not wearing glasses. <clears throat> Unfortunately, there is no procedure that can fully correct the kind of faulty vision Jesus is talking about here. Not even Dr. Jesus can permanently remove the filters by which we view ourselves and others and the world around us. But, I believe in his teachings, including what he says here is about the splinter and the log, as well as his example, and including what he does here with this woman he saves from being stoned to death, can at least help us put some kind of brakes on our natural tendency to put ourselves at the center of things and assume that the way we see things the way they truly are. In 1 Corinthians 13, a version of which we're going to sing in a moment, 
famously known as the love chapter, St. Paul reminds us, now we see through a mirror dimly, but one day we will see face to face. Oh, well, we look forward to that day of full clarity of seeing everything and everyone as they truly are. That's going to be a grand and glorious day. See